we have uh, Kate Griffiths with us from Pride London, who um, not only has uh, a great story to tell about best practice in suicide prevention, but um, Pride London is, uh, is, is an endeavour that I hugely admire. So it's just great to have you here. So over to you. Mm -hmm. Everyone, and thank you for that lovely intro, Joe. Um, so, um, as Joe mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Thrive London today, and I'm our strategy and partnership lead within the team. Um, I guess a little bit about what Thrive is and who we are. So, um, we are here as a citywide movement um, to improve the mental health and wellbeing of all Londoners. Um, and we are supported by um, the partners at the bottom of the slide there. So that includes the Mayor of London, but also um, <laughs> NHS um, London, London Councils, and Public Health England. So really all your really key um, health and social care leaders within the sphere. And I thought it would be useful today just to talk to you a bit about kind of what we've been up to. Um, so more generally within our work, but also specifically our work around suicide prevention. So I guess the first question is why London? Um, what we know from the stats is that 2 million Londoners, so you're looking at a population around 8.8 .8 million currently, so nearly a quarter of all Londoners suffer from poor mental health every year. That equates to 13 people on every bus, or the very London-centric um, equivalent of 100 people on every tube. We know that this equates to 1 billion lost by London employers each year, and um, I think kind of most um, pertinent to today's discussion, um, that slide says 11 Londoners take their lives every week. Um, we unfortunately had the update last week, but this has actually increased to over 12, which I think really um, makes the claim of why we're here and why we're trying to make a difference. We also know that certain groups are more impacted by poor mental health because they are impacted by inequality. So we know that poor mental health is both the cause and the consequence of inequality, <coughs> and um, we know that certain groups are particularly impacted by this. So. For example, young Londoners from poor backgrounds are three times more likely to experience poor mental health in their lifetime than regular income peers. Um, we also know that African Caribbean men are more likely to be identified with a severe mental health condition, about four times more likely. And we also know that, um, and I think following Aileen's presentation about how it impacts all communities, um, completely agree. We know the London demographic, and I appreciate that comment as well about recent events and how that can impact we know that suicide disproportionately affects particular communities at the very local level in London. Okay, so I thought I'd go into first a bit about where we started back in 2017, and I'm pleased to say I've been there from the start, and in a good way, it feels a lot longer than two and a half years. But, um, so in July 2017, after having about 18 months worth of conversations with hundreds of Londoners, um, we had a summary of our work that looked to engage people, um, experts by profession and experience about what they thought could be done to improve mental health across London. Um, they came up with six areas, covering them briefly. So we've got a city where individuals and communities take the lead, a city with a happy, healthy and productive workforce, a city that maximises the potential of children and young people, a city free from mental health stigma and discrimination, a city with services that are there when and where needed, and lastly, a zero suicide city. Simultaneous to this kind of report of these six areas or findings, um, we launched our first Are We OK London campaign. So this was really kind of twofold. Firstly, quite selfishly, it was to get our name out there onto the scene in London. And secondly, it was really to get London, London's thoughts on our six ideas and aspirations. Um, we did this in a number of different ways. So those dirty posters you see there, um, we had these all across the tube network in London. We also had um, a huge social media campaign. Whilst we appreciate that kind of that's not the best way to access everyone, so we also had our very local problem solving booths. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain them today. They're quite an odd concept, but I do recommend you look them up. Um, and we have community workshops. Um, we also spent a lot of time in uh, fairs across the summer, kind of local London events. So I spent a lot of summer 2017 under a leaf of while it was raining in mid-July on a weekend, which was fantastic. Um, and one of the reasons it was fantastic was, um, I'm really pleased to say we had uh, we generated a huge amount of interaction and interest. So generated over 420,000 interactions over our first summer, and this led to around 250 partnerships and over 30 projects. Um, so I thought kind of given that's where we started, it might be useful to talk about what we're doing today. 
So we've still got our activities, those kind of six aspirations I mentioned, but we're kind of divvying them up in different ways now. So just to talk through what we have going on at the moment, um, as I said, about 30 different projects, but we group them in different ways. So the first is really around participation. Um, this is the driving force of who we are and what we do. Um, and we really look to empower Londoners, uh, the system, organisations to make a difference and improve mental health where possible. Partnerships, as I mentioned, we have a huge amount of partnerships and this is really where we see our role in kind of enabling the system to work better and to communicate better to improve mental health. We also have city-wide interventions. So these are really large-scale city-wide um, projects we deliver to make a difference. So a lot of these are around young London mental health, but also this is where our suicide prevention works in. We additionally have our core activities. So these are core activities um, we consider key to kind of really grow this city-wide movement. And this is what I'm talking a little bit more about in a moment. Um, and a recent kind of um, a couple of areas, we have development. So this is something we recognise that we are having been inundated by requests of work to be done. We are a very small team and we have a great deal of work, as I'm sure it's the same situation with everyone in the room. So um, this is something where we really highlight areas where we think we can innovate or make a difference. So for example, this year, our focus is on universities within London. And 400,000 um, students make up the university population in London. Lastly, um, this year we're really focusing on our monitoring, evaluation and learning. And we have always been evaluating, I think people would get a bit of a panic look when I say about that, but we've been evaluating different individual projects. Um, and this year we're really looking to see kind of how our combined effort is making a difference, essentially how the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so, and just within all of this, we do work at kind of very high local, so we're ground level charities and for individuals. We work at local, so local authority level, um, at STP, kind of sub-regional levels for people, NHS people in the room. We also work at that plan London level. So I just wanted to talk a bit through, I mentioned earlier, kind of our link between um, mental health and inequalities, and this was something we really developed last year. So we had a huge amount of research and a huge amount of participation last year to understand how the most marginalised communities in London really felt that inequality and discrimination was impacting on their mental health. Um, and while we recognise it's absolutely important to kind of see diversity across these different groups, we're not advocating the same approach for everyone, but there were some common themes that were found that we tried to focus our work on. So for example, they're around young people, and also, as I mentioned before, amplifying the voices of London is impacted by um, inequality and mental health. In terms of kind of what to do, so there's a recognition of the importance of social networks and also that idea of broadening opportunities. And lastly, we really found that Londoners wanted the tools and resources to improve things for themselves. This has really kind of informed some of our key projects this year, which I'll talk, to you, talk through very briefly. Um, so within these core activities, um, we have a fantastic champions network within Thrive, um, which has really been organically grown. So this is a group of about 70 different people um, who just came up to us kind of back in the summer of 2017 and said, this is amazing, I want to do more to help. Um, we looked to kind of a really Let's galvanise on this, um, and this is the idea that we have had meetings regularly for our champions, but they actually said, listen, we want to kind of tackle our local stakeholders, sometimes their local authorities, which is interesting because they are also our partners, um, so we want to look to empower them to do this. Um, our champions um, designed their own leadership development programme, and now we're working with um, the nationally very well-renowned Sheila McKechnie Foundation to deliver this. We also, very excitingly, um, so we had uh, World Suicide Prevention Day earlier this week, which I'm sure we're all aware, I'm sure we're all also aware that we've got World Mental Health Day in less than a month. Um, Thrive has committed to getting over a thousand young Londoners into City Hall in London for a young Londoner-led event. So this is really around getting young people with independent artists together to um, explore their mental health through different um, areas of culture. Um, so for example, we've um, created a new temporary art installation with young Londoners at the City Hall, which um, the amount of paperwork is a big achievement in itself. Um, lastly, uh, but I'd say what nearly most importantly, we have our Right to Thrive grant. So this was following this research that I mentioned earlier this year um, and last year. This is really around getting a grant scheme to work with communities. So again, as I mentioned, we have to appreciate the diversity across London. We are a small team. We don't hold all the expertise, so it's really around getting Londoners um, to work together in peer and community-led projects to try and improve equality and reduce poor mental health within their own communities. 
So that was a bit about what we're doing while working drive, and now I'm really pleased to talk to you through um, a bit about our suicide prevention work specifically. So, I think all of our suicide prevention work, we really have to absolutely credit our suicide prevention network or group um, that has been meeting since spring 2017. So this was initially a temporary task and finish group, and the idea behind it was to get a group of professionals and those with lived experience together <coughs> to um, really explore what options can be made to help prevent suicide across the capital. Um, I'm not going to do that big list, but um, we're currently, I think, at a total of um, 48 individuals from 36 organisations, which means room booking is a nightmare, but it's fantastic to have that amount of expertise within the room. So we've got representation from all London's first responder authorities, um, from the range of NHS public bodies, um, STPs, local authorities, we have academics, we have mental health trusts, we have third sector organisations, and um, most importantly, I believe, we have individuals with lived experience. Um, we have our two fantastic co-chairs there, Dr Phil Moore and Dr Sangeeta Mahajan. Um, and really, um, the group has continued to meet, so this is firstly to facilitate the objectives that I'm just about to talk through, but also because there was a real recognition that there wasn't kind of an equivalent at a pan under level that could really share best practice and that create partnership working around suicide prevention across London. This is why the group is hugely important to us and important to London as a whole. So, in terms of what the group is <coughs> up, um, I'll just run through these briefly. We had, um, so our first is around suicide prevention training for the education sector. I'm very pleased to say that um, we've commissioned and partnered with Papyrus to offer free training um, across London for the education sector. And by that I mean schools, colleges and universities, and we're looking to open this up to further education institutions as well. Um, this will be for a range of both staff and students, so your traditional teachers and academic staff, but also support staff, so for example caretakers who recognise that kind of a certain kid might be hanging around school a bit longer, um, and also students themselves, so everyone above the age of 16 will have the opportunity to have peer-led support. And within this we're looking to train over 2,000 individuals across the education sector within the next year. Our second piece of work is quite specific in comparison, so this was brought forward by a pharmacist within our group. Um, and this is really a piece of work to work with frontline professionals to develop guidance for those who may be at risk of overdose, um, and really just to make them aware to signpost and support them accordingly. So we're working with several London leaders within this area around this. And last but definitely by no means least, we have our information sharing hub. So um, we at Thrive believe that you really can't um, look to make a difference unless you have an understanding of the data. It makes it incredibly difficult to make meaningful interventions if you don't have an understanding of what's happening within your area. And this was certainly what was happening in London. So with this in mind, um, we've developed an information sharing hub that looks to have three key outcomes. <coughs> the first is around providing bereavement support for next of kin. This is currently quite patchy within London and it's very much a postcode lottery which really depends how much support you get. We're looking to equalise that across London. We're also looking to enable um, kind of system leaders, so both first responder authorities and local authorities, to plan and Im implement short-term interventions where necessary, and also do that really important work in the long-term end. So, for example, working with more vulnerable communities, working to shut down the high-risk locations, um, and again, without the information currently, it's incredibly difficult to do this. So we're just looking to kind of smooth over the whole system. Um, I've just got some potentially quite a rubbish screenshots to show you, apologies about that. But, um, so this really is our submission form. So this is um, kind of the first stage of the hub. So the hub is an online secure system for key system partners to um, log into um, and kind of input information. So in the tragic case of the suicide, um, a first responding officer would input this initial form. So this initial form um, takes approximately three minutes, we think, and it also means that information is with it and available within the hub within 72 hours. We also have more detailed information. So this is around um, circumstantial evidence um, from other partners. So for example, mental health trusts, um, ambulance service, fire brigades. So really getting everyone to work together in the system. So you'll have your initial demographic information available in the first 72 hours. And you'll have this far more detailed, rich information available within 28 days. Um, there's also this fancy mapping system that everyone seems to really like as an option there. But um, in terms of this, um, we're currently looking at an 18th month delay in suicide reporting within London. Um, 
So as I mentioned, we only kind of uh, got the 2018 figures out last week. Um, it's also incredibly high level information. The amount of detail um, and how quickly areas like where it will now be getting this information has hugely improved and will greatly advance the possibility for further suicide prevention interventions. Um, and just to note, the kind of the launch of this is fingers crossed today, um, which is very exciting and has been a large piece of work with a number of partnerships. Um, so I'm hoping Friday the 13th doesn't kind of live out its famous unfortunate day, but we'll see. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to talk through quite quickly about um, what we've been doing in the past couple of World Suicide Prevention Days. I think it's quite topical um, earlier this week. So I'm really pleased to say that as of 2018, um, we became a Zero Suicide Alliance member, and I was so proud to achieve this um, because Steve and I were talking in the break that, um, as I mentioned kind of previously, that Thrive um, set out an aspiration to be a Zero Suicide City in 2017. I don't know if partners have had this around the room, but the amount of arguments I had back in 2017 about whether this was possible, whether we should set this as an achievement, seeing a collaboration and leading the way with Zero Suicide Alliance has made such an impact, and I think. It means that everyone in the room can work, work together to make this all normality and make this something that can really make a difference and really make change. Um, and lastly, just want to talk about what's happening on Tuesday. It's going to be a week. I think Geraldine already mentioned this, but um, I'm really pleased to say that we have launched a partnership campaign with Zero Suicide Alliance. Um, and this was launched by the mayor on Tuesday. Bit of a candid shot there. The mayor. Um, and this is essentially to um, promote the training and um, encourage 100,000 Londoners to undertake the training by World Suicide Prevention Day in 2020. Um, so we've got a huge range of groups. <laughs> so we've got these to give out, so please feel free to take some. Um, but essentially, we're looking to get as many Londoners as possible to undertake the training. Um, we already have commitments from partners on the day. So for example, the Met committed to um, training three thousand officers within six weeks on the Zero Suicide Alliance training. Um, whilst it's fantastic that we have these partner contributions, we're also looking to target everyday Londoners to ensure as many people as possible have access and are encouraged to undertake the training. So with that in mind, I hope to come back on World Suicide Prevention Day 2020, the next conference, to kind of say that hopefully we've massively surpassed our 100,000. But fingers crossed, let's see. It's lovely, great. Thank you very much, everyone. I think I'm doing questions in the Q&A slot, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you.